Welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University. This podcast seeks to bring together the worlds of academia and professional practice. If you're interested in the latest research and trends in sport and want to hear from experts from around the world, then subscribe now because this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Martin Foster, Applied Sport Management Lead at Loughborough University. Today, we're with Joe Piggin, Senior Lecturer in Sport Management at Loughborough University. Joe is an expert in sport management and policy and has a particular interest in health. We're going to hear from Joe and his thoughts on junk food companies and sponsorship in sport. So, Joe, how are you? Great to be here and thank you for having me. You're most welcome. Seeing as though you live next door and I can knock on your on your wall, yep. it's not been too far for you to come, has it? Has the journey been okay? It's been good. I'm, I've had a good healthy lunch. I've got my water. I'm ready to go. Okay, so as we've said, we're going to be talking about junk food companies and sponsorship. Um, first of all, what made you so passionate about getting into this in, in terms of research? Yeah, I've played sport for many years. Um, I've backed off the competitive stuff recently, but in my younger days, I competed a lot. And as a result, I consumed a lot as well. And through my work, you know, which is about sport policy, sport management, it got me thinking, well, what are the effects of the sport industry on the consumers who are fans of it, who participate? And it got me thinking, you know, um, what is the effect particularly of the, the brands and the companies who we are told make sport happen? That's a good point, actually. So in terms of these companies we talk about who, who make sport happen, mm-hmm. and we're suggesting the money that they put into sport is, is helping generate things move forward. It, the money is certainly influential in creating the structures which we currently have. If the money wasn't there, there would be different structures. But, yeah, certainly the, the, the often enormous financial input that these sponsors, junk food sponsors, put into sport, it does have an effect. Okay, so you mentioned junk food. So just yeah. can we just define what we're saying junk food is? Yeah, so the, the term junk food is a quite a colloquial term, and a lot of people have a general understanding about what it is, but my perspective is it, it, it's food that we really should not be eating. It's food we should avoid. And I'll give you a couple of brief examples. Um, in Brazil, um, the Ministry of Health says that people should not eat any ultra-processed food. So ultra-processed food is you know, something which has been uh, uh, produced, created uh, through a, a series of industrialization processes um, uh, uh, where its final state doesn't resemble anything which could have been a, 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 a natural food. So, so there's things added to it and things taken out in the manufacturing process. Very much. It's a combination of yeah, additives and, and, and extracted elements from it. Yeah. Any, 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 any examples of specific foods that, that you know you personally avoid or and people should avoid with that? We are told, aren't we, that we should have a balanced diet, that we should have a balanced diet. A lot of people believe that. Now, a lot of companies sell us that idea that our diet should be balanced as if we can eat anything in moderation. Now, that's a powerful idea because that that suggests, go on, eat our products. They're okay for you as long as you don't eat too much. Now, that idea is powerful because I would say that, well, no, I would agree with the Brazilian Ministry of Health, which says you should not be eating some foods. It's better for you if you avoid that food. It's better for your wallet if you avoid that food. And it's better for society if you avoid particular junk foods. It's a good answer, and, and me and you yep. know, I could now start talking about Brazil and what they yep. do and all the yeah. rest of it, but yeah. for today, yep. we'll have to kind of cut that off and go sure. back to the, the event side. So, so we've established what junk food companies are. What are they gaining from sponsoring sport? So the simple marketing logic is that they connect with consumers uh, at a very emotional time in their lives. Sport is emotional. It, it's about being involved. It's about joy. It's about the, the uncertainty of an outcome. And all of that leads to consumers uh, you know, being excited about it. 
And so that's the reason why sport organizations, sports clubs, sports events, they are targeted by uh, food companies, by alcohol companies. In the past, they've been targeted by cigarette companies. Uh, they, uh, they are still targeted by gambling companies. And now you think of these four examples, gambling, cigarettes, alcohol, and junk food. Those are things which cause a lot of harm in society. But, and this is where we get into the economics of it, um, the, the companies which sell a lot of these types of products, um, they, they have the money to be able to sponsor these organizations and events because a lot of these products are, are pretty cheap to make at scale. So they're trying to put them into the into the event to promote them so that those people there yep. get emotionally attached to them and then they go and buy them. That's, That's, that brand loyalty is, is, is what it's all about. And in fact, you know, I, I think of an example right here in England uh, where the company called McDonald's has um, recently reinvested. They've, they've invested for the previous decade. They've recently made a decision to reinvest in, um, in the, the Football Association of England and so they, I think they're committing to something like, you know, helping provide about five million hours of football for young people. Now that sounds great, but I'm sure you and our listeners could understand that that you know, if that's five million hours of football which McDonald's is helping create, well, they will want to have a um, a, a reason to be there beyond just helping children. They'll want to get their branding their logo into these sports settings I, the, the McDonald's example I think is brilliant but years ago I remember coaching football and seeing McDonald's had done that whole thing um, where they'd sponsored football and the cones and the footballs and everything yep. Yep. had McDonald's on it yep. so Saturday morning the kids are there playing football yep. what's the first thing they say when they get off the pitch to yep. their mum and dad and, and you know now I've not, I've not there's anecdotal evidence to suggest that that's true and, and intuitively it seems true doesn't it that, that yeah if the more you the more young people are, are pestered by by a brand or or encouraged to see a particular brand, the more they will pester their parents to, to you know buy that particular product or brand or whatever. Um, yeah, so it, I'm I'm suffice to say I'm fascinated by this decision uh, of of a, a company of a food co- a restaurant like McDonald's to sponsor. Uh, children's sport why would they be sponsoring children's sport it's a very good question Um, and I think you've you've alluded to there that you're quite passionate about the this sponsorship side with regarding children Um, so I mean I've been reading around a few things before we we spoke Um, I think there's a a situation where Coca-Cola are sponsoring a park lives program in in London Um, so uh, what the purpose from Coca-Cola is and again they're associating their brand with physical activity Activity, so a similar thing to the McDonald's side, um, but some research has, has been out there suggesting what they get in return. Yeah. So uh, um, this was recent research which was published by Ben Jane and Cass Gibson, and it examined this uh, the Coca Cola sponsorship of Park Lives, and what they did they, they did a content analysis so that say so they examined these visual uh, visual displays of. Twitter content actually which was specifically around this Park Lives physical activity program and Park Lives is about you know getting people into parks getting them active getting them part of the community which all sounds wonderful and what they found was that 79% of the images contain children and 45% of these images contain prominent Coca-Cola branding so Coca-Cola you know, sponsors the program but Coca-Cola is, is, is an uh, it's an interesting situation because a lot of these companies make uh, voluntary commitments not to target children in their advertising. Mm-hmm. Um, now, in this case, the researchers found that you know that there was clearly a connection between the Coca-Cola branding and the the use of images of children, you know, playing and participating. So. 
So these companies are, are, are really trying their best, I would say, um, and and maybe not the, maybe the outcomes aren't always the best for the communities, depending on the case study. Um, but there's, there are ways that these companies, uh, the methods that they have to target children and to to get their attention. So, so what yeah. I read is that they, one of the ways to try and reduce this is that these companies are self-regulating mm. um, targeting mm. children. Mm. How does that work? How how, how do yeah. these companies who are we know actively targeting children? How do they all self-regulate, not doing it? Yeah. Clearly, they're still doing it. Yeah, well, yeah. Self-regulation sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, as if the company is saying, "Look, I'll, I'll be a good corporate citizen. I'll be responsible." But any corporation, and, and perhaps I should have mentioned this earlier, any corporation is trying to make money. And, and a great way to make money is to develop, to develop loyal customers. And if we develop customers, if we develop connections with customers when they're young, the logic is they will be brand loyal for hopefully their life. Um, and so, so in terms of vo- you know, self-regulation or voluntary regulation, what some of these companies say is, oh, look, we, we won't knowingly target young people or, you know, or children under, you know, different companies have various ages, uh, maybe it's 12, maybe it's 16 years old. So they won't knowingly target their, um, their products at these children. But what they will do is promote a community event oh, yeah, where that. children are going to attend. So they're actually perceived as promoting the community promoting physical activity which is what they are doing but we know in the background they're getting brand loyalty and they're going to sell more products because why else would they be doing I would I would I agree with you and I I don't think this is a conspiracy theory I think it's just a it's the marketing logic you know I don't think you need to be a conspiracy theorist to say oh this is their secret plan they've got going (laughs) you know I mean it's out there I would say in black and white or in this case it's red and white you know it, it, it's a matter of displaying these company logos as prominently as possible um, to you know to develop that connection you're talking about you're talking about drinks there and we've had conversations before about sports drinks um, yeah. in particular so one of the things with sports drinks was that their sports drinks you know are there and we've all had that advertisement that you know dehydration is a real bad factor when it comes to performance um, and these sports drinks are developed to improve athletic performance yet the market has gone way beyond performance it, it's everywhere and I think you mentioned to me before that sports drinks are sold in the aisles as soft drinks yeah in, in the same in the same sections you know they're, they're um, and, you know what does that say about who your neighbours are on the supermarket shelf you know you've got you've got high sugar drinks next to high sugar sports drinks often now the interesting thing about sports drinks is uh, um, our our listeners will realise that that these companies are increasingly turning to you know calling their their drinks zero sugar or zero or desperately trying to cut out the the sugar content because there's a perception that that is what's contributing to um, uh, dental cavities in young children contributing to childhood obesity so the market to use the term it, it is changing in response to what has been a lot of criticism about their their self-regulated behaviour. In regards to sports drinks, um, is the evidence that's out there true about sports drinks? What I mean, there's some, there's some other, other other articles out there suggesting that um, there's a lot of bias towards how how good these sports drinks are, even for performance. Yeah, I, I think. Um, we should have a healthy cynicism about um, some of the research which is put out about sports drinks and how wonderful they are for you because we know what's happened in the past is that uh, uh, sport drinks companies have funded the research which shows that their drinks are fantastic for you. Now, to me and to many people, that doesn't sound like rigorous research. There, there it seem to be some serious conflicts of interest in terms of you know, what, research is, what research questions are being asked 
and what answers are, are, are coming out of it. For example, we, we tend not to read about research which shows that, okay, this particular food or sport drink had little to no effect or, dare I say, a detrimental effect. It, it, it seems bizarrely magical that so much of this research shows that all of these high sugar sports drinks are good. I, I think we should, we should be suspicious about some of these findings. And in fact, uh, just a couple of years ago, it was at the British Medical Journal that, um, that did a little bit of an expose about the value in, in these sports drinks for, for, for most performers. And it's probably something you, you could know more about in terms of... A little bit. I think yeah, the, the one you're referring to is the truth about sports drinks and, and the essential um, the, the essential information is basically they might not be as good as people say they are. Dehydration might not be the bigger factor that people suggest this is. Um, and that's on the, the sports performance side of things. Take that further down what we're looking at. We're looking at obesity and, and all those yep. problems. Yep. And we've, we've got that link again of athletes being sports and being a role model and, and standing in front of people and inspiring them yeah. um, and then telling them to go and drink this sports drink when what they're doing where it's 10 hours of training or more every yeah. week is not comparable yeah. to a child who is potentially running around for an hour exactly and um you know, I think it's it's a real problem beyond just the the, the lack of uh, value which young people would get from these sports drinks. It's also about the cost to them and their parents. I mean, each one of these drinks, you know, it can cost what a pound, a pound fifty, two pound, maybe more sometimes. So there's actually, yeah, you know, th- there are s- uh, specific costs, financial costs to consuming this stuff. There's also potential for serious dental costs as well. We know if, if you, uh, you know, the, the, the dental literature suggests that in this country, the teeth that of young people are being damaged by these ultra processed drinks and food. So, you know, I mean, if, if there's any reason to to make changes in in what, how we think about sport, we should think about children's teeth at the very least. So we'll, we'll, we'll hold that question for a moment because I want to ask you yep. later on who's yep. responsible for making change and how we should sort that out. But we'll, we'll okay. hold it for now because I just want to look at a, a few other examples. So I know you've done a lot of research around this with some examples. So have you got some examples for us um, about the types of sponsorship deals that are out there, uh, whether it be for kids or whether it be at events or, or things like that? What, what evidence have you got for this? So I'll give you a couple of brief examples from the, the this is the, the English football football structure people talk about the pyramid you've you've got at the top you've got well you've got fifa which is a trans transnational body all the way down to local sports clubs and um i think your listeners might be interested to know that uh fifa is sponsored by coca-cola mcdonald's and budweiser the football association in england is sponsored by walkers crisps Big Cola, Lucasaid, Mars, uh, McDonald's as well. Uh, the Premier League is sponsored by Coca-Cola, Cadbury, the chocolate company. Uh, the F- English Football League is sponsored by Carabao in- uh, Energy Drink and Iron Brew. We- interestingly, Wembley Stadium, the actual stadium is sponsored by Carlsberg, Walker's Crisps as well, Coca-Cola and Mars. And of course, all the way down to the grassroots, which I mentioned earlier has got that massive sponsorship deal with McDonald's restaurants. So there's a lot of examples in there which most health professionals would suggest, well, yeah, you should really think about consuming less of these particular products and, and brands. So, yeah, and, and that, that's just football. And now football in this country, I know, I'm, I, I'm still a foreigner here. I'm originally from New Zealand. But I've, I've, I've witnessed the passion which goes into football by young people, by parents, by the, the, these elite players themselves. And, you know, it, it goes back to that idea about emotion. People are emotionally attached to, to these uh, players and clubs and, and participating. And so, of course, all of these companies are going to want to get in on that party, that, that wonderful space of sport. So you mentioned 
obviously these are pretty much high energy um, products that are being sponsoring the entire pyramid of, of, of football. Um, what would happen if this was all removed? Because obviously what we're talking here is these are sponsoring things pretty much so that physical activity can happen and they will promote things based on increased physical activity. Um, I think I've read another paper um, whether it did talk about some uh, bias research going on or not, yep. was Coca-Cola looking at actually it isn't what they can consume and talking about having a balanced diet, mm. it's the lack of physical activity. Mm. So would it be that these companies are saying you can have a balanced diet but you need to do more physical activity mm. and actually they are not only part of the problem but could potentially be part of the answer yep. by these physical activity events that they're putting on or is it that actually they are part of the problem yep. and they are disguising the problem by trying to promote physical activity so there's a few different things I want to say yeah, there's a, a lot of questions in that it's a very <laughs> provocative topic first of all I would say that nobody should um, get their diet advice or physical activity advice from a company that sells what I would call junk food I, I would say they they are not experts in diet and physical activity so, so in a sense, I, I wouldn't give them a place at the table, so to speak, to, to offer opinions about healthy living. No, no, no. Maybe they could offer opinions about how to generate enormous amounts of profit from developing brand loyalty from young people. Maybe they could do that. But I wouldn't go to any of the companies I mentioned for diet advice or physical activity advice. And so that leads me on to a second part of my answer, which would be... Uh, if, if they were to be removed, it would be an entirely wonderful thing. Um, this, it would look different. Um, it would be different. Young children would not be wearing, for example, uh, McDonald's kits. But I don't think that would be such a bad thing. I think, in fact, that would be a wonderful thing. If, if um, youth, particularly junior sport, children's sport, if it was not sponsored by... Um, restaurants which sell uh, what most people would term junk food. Going to hold it there again with the question that I may have regarding that and just kind of elaborate slightly yep. more. So we've talked about football and we've talked about events, um, but I know we, we've discussed in the past about athletes themselves. Yeah. So have you got some specific examples around that, around role models and, and, and where their part fits within this sponsorship yep. and junk food? Yeah, no, it's really interesting. And, and two years ago, this was at, at Rio 2016, you, we, we probably all remember Team GB and what a wonderful occasion that was for the country. Also looking back to London 2012, what, you know, what a great few years of, of, of elite performance by these national representatives, particularly uh, at the Olympics and Winter Olympics. Now, Team GB uh, has been sponsored by Kellogg's for many years, uh, along with Team Ireland as well. And now Kellogg's is a company; it's a, they're, they're doing their thing, they're selling their products. I, I, you know, they're clearly entitled to do that. What I have an issue with is when, like at Rio 2016, they adorned their their uh, ultra processed foods such as cocoa pops, crunchy nut corn flakes. These these other products which are very high in sugar. I think cocoa pops has about 35 grams of sugar per 100 grams at, uh, during Rio 2016. Yeah, you know, that, that's a level of sugar which which you know, young children should simply not be. So we're talk, we're talking. So let's put that in perspective. We're yeah. talking seven spoonfuls of sugar going into their bowl. You know. So, a lot of sugar, teaspoons yeah, of sugar, seven yeah. of them going yeah. into their into their yeah. um, into their breakfast cereal. Yeah, yeah. So, and and of course we know that young people love this uh, exciting, uh, tasty, crunchy cereals. Now Kellogg's, as a major sponsor of Team GB, would m make a connection between their product and the athletes themselves and uh, the Olympic athletes. In fact, all over the uh, the cereal packet. They had various uh, famous British athletes all holding their gold medals and holding up the, the, the Union Jack flag and being very proud representatives. 
And so if you're a parent thinking, well, gee, um, should I be buying this high sugar cereal for my child? Perhaps I shouldn't, but at the same time, um, on Cocoa Pops packets, Crunchy Nut Corn Flakes, you could win a day with an Olympic hero. So there's there's some very confusing messages. So what's going on in the parent's mind? Are they are they thinking, gee, I'll, I'm, if, if this has got Olympic athletes on the packet, it must be okay, mustn't it? So... So you you can see in a in a, in a you know, for parents who have maybe been uh, pressured by their children to buy the colourful uh, cereal packets, yeah, it, it does create some some real issues in terms of health promotion. I think all of what you've kind of put across is is, is quite clear that there's a confused message, and I think that you know as a as a producer of any of these products they would like to be part of that promotion of sports and health so they're going to attach their brand to sport and, and health and it looks like sport has allowed that to happen um, and have taken on money to promote their you know their physical activity or, or their activities or to buy new players or wherever whatever whatever level it may be yep. they've done it now it comes to the question that I've only been putting off and putting off that who should take responsibility for not allowing this to happen? If we are perceiving yeah. and we're trying to put evidence for that this is a problem, yeah. it is heavily linked to obesity and what we're suggesting. Yeah. Um, so who should who should stop this happening? So two of the most powerful sports brands, which I just mentioned in this country, are of course the English FA, the Football Association, the Premier League, and of course Team GB, which you know, organises the, the Olympic athletes and, and helps them. So people in those organisations are, are, are under pressure for, for financial resources, like so many sports organisations. If any company, whether it's a car company or an insurance company or a, a junk food company, if any of those companies go to them with, a, with an offer... You know, saying, "Look, we'll we'll sponsor your organisation if you give us access to your target market, to your markets." That would be a very difficult position to say, um, uh, "Thanks, but no thanks." Um, you know, so I, I don't. Um, I I do feel very sorry for these uh, marketing managers, these leaders of these organisations who are under pressure to to take money from McDonald's, Mars, Coca-Cola, Cadbury. You know, it, 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 you know, some of this money is very lucrative. You know, the, the sponsorship deals, the, they are, you know, they are agreed to for a reason because there's, there's significant money behind it. So if we're saying the pressure is too much on some of these clubs to turn down, are we then saying that it should be the government who steps in and puts something in place? Yeah, so so one, I say radical sol- solution to part of this, even though it's not so radical really, is that, well, actually some of these companies could pay more tax. And so by taxing these companies more, that money could go to the government and the government could distribute that to the various national governing bodies for sport. So there are different, there's a, there's a variety of different ways of, of funding sport. And, you know, for me, I, I personally, I, I think that there are various health crises in this country and around the world and they are so significant that maybe some radical change is actually needed. And where where sports organisations you know, should start saying either thanks but no thanks, or they should be uh, pressuring the government to you know make changes to the to the taxation system. Um, you know, a lot of people don't like to talk about tax because they they don't understand it. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're not accountants necessarily, especially at a national level. But, you know, tax money is used for health promotion. So so there are ways of, of reorganising where the money goes. So, for example, instead of a, a restaurant chain giving a lot of money to a, to a, a football association, Maybe you know, the restaurant chain could pay more tax, and and it could re, re, be redistributed by the government. 
It does sound like a quite a radical solution, um, you know, but it, but it may work. What about, what about the athletes themselves? Could they have any, any impact upon this? Yeah, they, they should start saying no to sponsorship deals from these companies. I mean, I, you know, I, I appreciate they're conflicted, but a lot of these elite athletes, professional athletes, like to call themselves role models as if they're inspiring young people. Well, I would say if you're going to inspire young people, why don't you say no to what are clearly unhealthy products? There's potential you know, for this. But it, it takes a, 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 a lot of willpower from the athletes involved because, you know, the, these athletes, I understand a lot of them are struggling for, for funding, um, particularly these sort of, uh, you know, passionate amateur athletes who go to the Olympic Games and aren't necessarily on, on yeah. uh, large incomes. Look, to go back to the football example, where some of these athletes are on extremely large incomes, um, if, for example, even playing for the national English national team, you know, I've seen photos of some of them recently um, adorning marketing material for for Mars. So, you know, I, I think that, that doesn't sound right, especially when sorry, just to say, especially when um, these athletes are, are often adored by people on very low incomes, low income families, um, people living in uh, uh, areas of low socioeconomic status, and you know, who are who look to role models. And what do they see? They see these national superstars holding up a Mars bar. Yeah, you know, and I think that could change, couldn't it? It'd be interesting, actually. I was just going to say yeah. to to look at the the legal side of that, um, and we could speak to other colleagues about that. But regarding if the FA is sponsored by Mars and they're sponsoring them to get access to these athletes, what would be the the implications if athletes said no, yeah. I'm not doing that, and are the athletes paid additionally to go and stand in that photo? It'd be interesting to find out mm. that kind of information. It'd be interesting to know how much these athletes know about the impact that this is having. Mm. Um, so that would be some interesting education to the athletes, education yeah. at all levels, I think is the only way we can really start to try and make any changes to this. I think I think education. Don't get me wrong. I think education is important, and 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 you know, helping people understand the serious detrimental effects of this, and that is one aspect of of a of a multifaceted solution. I would say too that yeah, you know, change the taxation system, change the you know, change the incentives for um, uh, for sponsorship. You mentioned changing, and I'm slightly going off piste with this because it's something that I wanted to, to get into this, this chat. Um, there was some other research. Um, in fact, it was research from yourself um, talking about 2016 and what food is available when you go to these mega events. So I know a lot of your research is on mega events. It's not just mega events. It's a lot of events, and this is a pet hate of mine. Yep. I go to Nottingham Forest, and, uh, and yep. I go and watch football uh, there. And whenever you go to any of these football stadiums, all you can eat is burgers and pies and alcohol and sweets and these kind of things there you know I'm sure there are examples where there's, there's, there's healthier stadiums but I haven't seen this change in years and this has been going on for a while so you know you tell us a little bit about your research what you found in 2016 but then also talk about how how we could potentially change this mm-hmm. so in 2016 we uh, conducted research at the euro 2016 football uh, championships which people might remember was in france and we also conducted research at the rio olympic games to look at what happens at events for spectators and it, it's as you say and, and as many people could imagine um um, the food on offer at both of those events was incredibly ultra processed, you know, very limited choice, and most people would say it was unhealthy food. That that you shouldn't, you know, that that is that that is not food is not good for health. Now, what's interesting about both of those events, Euro 2016 and Rio 2016, they both made commitments to promote healthy food. So they actually put together strategy documents and policy statements claiming that they would offer a healthy range of food. And when we first got to Euro 2016 and then afterwards 
uh, the Rio Olympics, we were amazed to see that all of those claim, all of those wonderful claims about promoting health and you know through these events, it just didn't follow through into reality. So somewhere between the claims of health promotion and the actual practice, something clearly went wrong. And our suspicion is what went wrong was the the profit motive. Uh, you know, if you capture a large number of people and you have them pretty much caged into your event for either three hours, of maybe for a football game, or or a whole day at the Olympics, you know, you could serve them a, a range of of only processed, ultra processed food, and you know they would have to put up with it. Lot in the same way that. Customers at football clubs, Nottingham Forest, um, other, uh, Queens Park <laughs> Rangers as well. A quick shout out to all the all the Rs fans. You know, at, at these stadiums, you, you are you are a captive audience in a sense, aren't you? And you could argue, well, look, you just take your own food or or don't eat at the stadium. But but you know, that's not always always easy. It's almost to part do. of the experience. It is part of the experience. To, yeah, yeah, absolutely. To to enjoy the 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 food that's on offer. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of change that, that is still needed at football clubs around this country. Yeah, I, I, think, I think to make it clear from my perspective, it's not that, you know, get rid of all those ultra-processed food, although I can see the benefits of that. People go there and want that. So I, I do think there should be some uh, freedom of choice there. But at the moment, there is no choice. You have to eat that. And I think, I think some of these places should be saying, actually, we're going to offer an alternative as well. Um, now it might be the profit margins that, that's restricting that I don't know but it'd be interesting to see or we'll be interested to try and work with the club um, to make those changes and see if we could actually show that those profit margins don't get hit yeah I think gone are the days where healthy food is the bland food you know I think people realise now that healthy food can be incredibly delicious and nutritious so you know I think the tide is turning away from people accepting this you know low Low quality, uh, you know, low in nutrients, uh, quite costly junk food at various events. So, you know, I, I think the time for change is coming for for that domain, that area as well. Um, I totally agree. I, re- I really think that if somebody did step up and say, you know, right, we're going to offer one hundred percent healthy food at our stadiums. I think, like you said, they've got a captive audience, yep. so people would eat it and actually might realise that it doesn't taste like cardboard and it is actually nicer. That's it. Um, I remember, you know, when when I probably made more of a conscious decision to start eating healthily. Yeah. When you eat some of those more processed foods, which inevitably does happen still, mm-hmm. you realise how bad they are. Yeah. Um, and it'd be interesting yeah. for clubs to take that on board. Well, and and there, there's a there is an incentive for clubs to make this change. Many of their spectators. Uh, not everybody, of course, but a lot of them tend to be older males. I, I think that's fair to say. A lot of young fans as well, but a, a large demographic is who go to the watch the games are older males, and and you know these are uh, folk who often are not as active as they perhaps should be. Some of these clubs have got physical activity programs to promote health to their their their, their bigger fans who might want to lose some weight and get healthier. And so there, there's, it's, it feels like only half the equation is happening. These clubs are, are you know, encouraging these, these older fans to train at the stadium, you know, these particular program days, and yet they're still serving quite unhealthy food. So half the battle is there and half the battle is still to go. And it's a good point because I think, like you said, if clubs, that they are trying to embrace this part of the community um, aspect of their roles, and if yep. they are truly there for the community, then health should be be you know very high up on the agenda so yep. it should be something that they start to look at It'd be really interested to see if anybody does kind of take the ball by the horns and make this happen and it would be in their economic interest yeah. because if they have their fans living longer their fans will keep on coming to games for longer so they'll have have a bigger fan base so everybody but wins everybody wins <laughs> apart from the junk food companies maybe yeah, that's a good point. Um, so, I think we've touched on lots of different areas there with sponsorship, and I think we can see where the sponsorship and the junk food really aligns. So, I'm going to kind of leave it to you a little bit now to say, if, if Joe Piggin yep. was in charge of this for for the day or for forever, for the future, yep. what changes would you bring about across across the whole piece? Yeah. 
So immediately at uh, sports facilities, you know, like community leisure centres, at sports clubs, at schools, at universities, I would take immediate action to remove all of these drink machines, snack machines, which are, are so often filled with you know, ultra-processed junk food. That would be step one. And when you remove something like that, it does create a space for something else uh, to you know to replace it. I would also, as in healthier healthier food to to replace the junk food. Um, at, at football organisations and sport organisations who are who are in, in involved in these multi year sponsorship deals, I would encourage. Uh, if I was making the decision, I would just make some drastic decisions and say, we're not accepting any more sponsorship deals from junk food companies. We've had enough of that. In fact, there is a precedent for that. They did that with cigarette companies. Cigarette companies can no longer sponsor sport in, in most countries because people recognize, actually, that product is really harmful. And so people are recognizing more and more that consuming these uh, you know, ultra-processed junk foods is harmful. It's, um, yeah, really inspirational kind of, um, you know, changes that could be made. I, I, think, I think the flavor of the whole thing really points to sport as a whole to step up and to say, you know what, we have a healthy product and to stop allowing these unhealthy products to try and piggyback on our name um, and try and generate health yeah. from what we do and for them to push back a bit. You know, I think a lot of people said when um, cigarettes and, and smoking couldn't sponsor that, you know, everything would collapse, we'd have no money anymore. It didn't happen. That's so, a lot of scaremongering about, about making changes. And, you know, change can be scary and difficult, but... But you know, if if changes are being made for the sake of the health of young people, including their teeth and their their overall health and their wallets as well, eating healthy can be cost effective as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think it, there's a there's a better future, and and you know perhaps children won't have to tolerate putting on jerseys with junk food companies and like you say, kicking footballs with spon- that are sponsored by by junk food companies. I think, I think that's it I think if, if everybody within sport was to get together clubs fans communities even, even higher level of government and say sport is this healthy product let's keep it that way then I think all those changes that you want to see happen could happen for sure so that's our, that's our final final message to everybody. Everybody needs to step up um, and not take on these, these non-health food um, products. And hopefully the sports club, the sports event will see this change from the bottom. But if something could come from the top, that would be even better. That's it. And you make me think of elite sport. And in elite sport, they talk about marginal gains, don't they? And really going into the minutiae of performance. Well, if that same logic was applied to the current sponsorship agreement, Agreements, you know, these junk food companies would be gone in a day because they are simply not good for performance. Not only are they not good for, for performance, they're not good for cultural life, for uh, for local food producers. I think there's a lot of change to make. Definitely. Joe, I think we will call it a day there because I know me and you could talk about this subject forever and ever. So I just want to leave it to say thanks. Um, if our listeners would like to contact you about things, it's okay to, to get in touch via Twitter. Do that. That's the way to do it. And that's Joe Piggin PhD is, is your hashtag for Twitter. Exactly. Perfect. Thank you, Martin. It was great to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. See you soon. If you want to get in touch and let us know any subject areas or experts that you'd be keen to listen to, then contact me, Martin Foster, on m.foster at alborough.ac.uk or tweet me at martinfoster82. Bye for now. We'll see you next time.